If you are a writer with a very specific vision for your creative work and you want to retain creative control, one option may be self-publishing. Today, we're going to explore the benefits and also the difficulties of being a self-published author. Welcome to Creative Conversations, a Tiger Spirit podcast. I'm your host, Yang Mei Ui. Today, I'm talking to James Zazana, author of the Masco Trilogy. James brought out the books himself, and I was curious to find out from him what it's like to be writer, publisher, editor, marketer, and a whole lot more. Let's get on with the show. Most of you will notice right away I'm an American. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I'm not uh, British, uh, and uh, I've been in London this trip for two weeks, and I leave on Wednesday to uh, visit my daughter in Sweden. She teaches English in Sweden. Uh, I have retired from being a full-time university professor. I did my Ph.D. at the University of Notre Dame, and they did lose this weekend, those of you that follow American football. So it's a sad weekend. But um, I taught at a small um, state university in Marshall, Minnesota, which is a very rural area of Minnesota. But our campus is very famous for uh, writers, uh, poets, local regional writers, and I chose to write sci-fi, but the university was very accommodating. So I did not have to do the usual heavy research type writing. I actually did more administrative work, work with advising and uh, whatnot. American universities are very different than Oxford, Cambridge. Um, ours especially is almost an open university. So we are dealing with first-generation students, and we, I, you did a lot of advising and some of it hand-holding to get them sort of understand. But anyway, 27 years there, 41 years total in the classroom. And uh, for the last 19 years, I've been working on the Marsco books. Uh, there are four, the Marsco Saga. Two are published, two more are they're written, and I'm in the process of editing them. Uh, and I'm actually in London researching a completely different book, which I might speak about a little bit later. But uh, Marsco started uh, 19 years ago. And uh, But I was, as I say, full-time teaching, and during that time I also became chair of the department, which is heavy administrative work, so I could not write full-time like I wanted. I had a few sabbaticals, but um, mostly it's been on weekends and summers. And so uh, Marianne and I, did, my wife Marianne and I, decided uh, we were talking to the retirement consultant <laughs> And uh, I asked them, you know, if I keep teaching like this until I'm 67, you know, what would be the difference between now and retiring? And he said, $100 a month. I'm there. <laughs> so I looked at Marianne, $100 a month, I don't think so. She goes, oh, you're a lot happier retired. So uh, retired from full-time teaching, but full-time writing, as I was explaining earlier, I've got uh, five between now and Christmas, five uh, readings and workshops at local libraries, high schools, di uh, different things like that. So uh, I keep busy, <coughs> and I'm working on uh, editing book three, yeah. so I, I've got to get book three done. Yeah. So so I think this is um, the, the, the problem that many writers have and many creative people have, that you actually have to have a day job. Yeah. And, and that kind of gets in the way of, of yeah. the writing. Yeah. Um, and so that's why it's taken you 19 years right. to, to, yeah. to write yeah. this. And I love the teaching. So it's, it, I didn't look at it as drudgery. It wasn't. Uh, when I was much younger, I taught uh, uh, check groceries at, at Lucky Stores, which would be like a Tesco. Was that yeah, yeah. <laughs> something like that? And so teaching is much more enjoyable than that. Although it was a good it was a good job for a college kid. But um, yeah, the, lots of things get in the way. Uh, Marianne's a poet, but uh, it's very difficult for her. She's director of creative writing and teaches a full load and has to do writing conferences, and she's quite busy, and it's, it's very difficult for her to sustain, uh, you know, writing projects. Mm -hmm. So she has two big projects, and it's, it's hard so, to get So in out. terms of these four books, um, and I, I apologize for referring to it as a trilogy. I don't know what you call a... Isn't it a tetralogy? That's why I call it a saga. There is a name for it. There, I could dig out my PhD and get to that name, yeah, but I English think it's tetralogy. We, we don't know what a yeah. quadrology is, or yeah. whatever. And so, did you um, conceive of the, the full saga um, 19 years ago, or did it evolve over time? <clears throat> no, I had a semester sabbatical coming up, and uh, uh, I was uh, started in, uh, after teaching summer school, I was going to be off 
until January. So from the middle of summer until January. And so I, I started um, writing what I thought would be a single volume called Marsco at that point. And I thought, well, by December, I'll have this written. I'll have an agent. I'll have it published. And probably I could retire from teaching in two years. I mean, so I was so naive. So I started writing it and very quickly um, realized that the plot that I had suggested for myself was going to take two novels, not one. And I said, okay, I can live with that. I can live with that. So by the, oh, probably November, I had finished book one. I was working on book two. So by the end of that sabbatical, I had one and a half books. Well, in the course of the first uh, one and a half books, there's a character who is writing the history of Marsco and how Marsco is a gigantic corporation that ends up running the earth. It's a near... Okay, well, this is, uh, why don't we pause, pause and, okay. and, and um, tell us about what the story of Marsco okay, is. Okay, sure, sure, a um, little, little thumbnail. Yeah. I won't give away any cliffhangers, but I do know how it ends. <laughs> um, Marsco is uh, a gigantic uh, multinational corporation and in the late 20s apart have been very successful in this mid 20 uh 21st century democracies are very weak and they're tottering and and marsco Uh, which exists in America, the Blackwater Corporation, uh, ends up uh, running uh, the world because it's a gigantic computer company and it controls who gets on or off the computers. They do that by implant. So on the cover of book one, you see the little what are called finger disks. And to run a computer, except for a few exceptions where you can do them without the finger disks, um, you, you have to be either part of Marsco or Marsco's approved you to use computers. So it's very few people. So the whole information age that we enjoy, I mean, my, my, my little uh, mobile phone on my belt got me here, figured out how to use the bus. Um, you, you couldn't have that unless you were in Marsco. So most people are not in Marsco. So the world is, uh, it's an exaggeration. I mean, all science fiction is an exaggeration, but it's this world where there is a technical elite that have whatever they want and then the rest are uh, sort of scattered. And it's kind of a thin little middle class called subsidiaries because they, they're necessary. They're like farmers and they run shops and do different things for Marsco. But they, if they aren't connected to Marsco, it's, ve it's very difficult to be an independent. There are a few kind of independents. One of my main characters is an independent. Uh, the Marsco Dissident is the first book and the, the main dissident is trying to be sort of a, a gentleman farmer off in the wilds of uh, California. So uh, Marsco runs the world. There's spaceships out to the solar, uh, uh, Mars and, and the asteroid belt. And, and so uh, there, there's a group of people that think they can actually escape the solar system, that, that they have developed a spaceship that can take in the technology to go into cryostasis. So book one and book two is kind of their story. And then there's, there are two groups of people, the officers that lost the war that brought Marsco to power have the ability to restart the war. And then a, the, the, you know, the angry disgruntled mob sort of taken in by religious fervor have decided that it's time for them to rebel. And the Marsco is a great Satan and, uh, so you have all these powers kind of thinking that they can they can totter or topple Marsco. So the first two books, uh, Marsco Dissident and Marsco Triumphant, kind of tell that story. And uh, uh, during that time, the Dissident Miller, one of my main characters, they keep referring to the fact that uh, he is trying to write the history of how Marsco came into being. And so uh, his work is called The Ascendancy of Marsco. So as I was writing book one and book two, book one was then called Marsco, book two was Marsco Triumphant, I said, well, I've got to write, I've got to write the, Mars the Ascendancy of Marsco. I keep talking about it, I've got to write it. So I got another 
sabbatical. This was in the heyday when Minnesota had money and education. I got two paid leaves in very short, about three years apart. And um, so I said, okay, I'm gonna, I had book one and two in draft form. And I thought, okay, I'm going to write book three. And I'm just going to play. I'm just going to experiment. So it's very, very experimental. Uh, I, I said, I'm going to give myself 100 pages, and I'm going to do this in pieces, because really Miller can't know the whole story. Nobody can know the whole story. So it's, uh, well, like podcasts, like what we're doing. It's, it's, the, uh, it, it's people being interviewed. It's journals. It's emails. There's a, a documentary of this woman who becomes very famous as as sort of the pretty face on this international TV network, and and it's her story, and then she just, you know, it's all BS, and then she tells the story of why it's all BS, and then there's her suicide note. So there's just these pieces, bits, pieces. There's about 14 voices telling the story. I've tried to get a couple of them published as short stories, but they end up being too long for a short story, too short for a novella, so I think I'm just going to have to put them put them in the, in the thing. Anyway, that's going to be out naturally. It was the third book I wrote, but it's going to be the fourth book. The third book, which I'm editing right now, is the Mars Coast Sustainability Project, and it takes place 50 years after the first two books end, and <coughs> it's the story where Mars Co has decided it will relinquish power. It's always said it was going to. It was only stepping in to stabilize, and then it's going to step back and let countries come back. So now it's living up to its promise. And, of course, there's a group of, of uh, Marsco associates that don't want to give up. I mean, they're ultimate power. Uh, they're, they run the world and all the way out to the solar system, part of the solar, or, yeah, solar system. So they figure, why give it up? And so there's so, backlash. So it, it sounds to me like, you know, although it's science fiction, and I think some people think, oh, science fiction, it's all about spaceships and aliens and whatever. Right. But actually, you're using science fiction <clears throat> to, um, to to discuss quite important current Thank affairs. Thank you. Quite yeah, hot, yeah. Hot topics. That's what a uh, couple of reviews that I've gotten, Kirkus and whatnot, uh, call it socioeconomic science fiction. I've been compared to 1984. Um, I really am trying to discuss things. Uh, um, Bleak House, Dickens' famous novel, in the third book, which is the fourth one I wrote, but, uh, there is a pretty pernicious character named Chesney, like Chesney Wool from Bleak House. Well, Chesney sounds a lot like Cheney. <laughs> <laughs> I think most people are going to see the connection. But, um, yeah, I hate to just step on American politicians, but some, some of them deserve it. But, uh, yeah, it, it's about uh, power. I mean, <clears throat> um, I think that's, it, in these books, what I'm really writing about is power and the abuse of power and who has power. I mean, communication is power. And the fact that you, you live in Britain, I live in the United States right now, anyway, we have huge personal freedoms. Uh, we, we can listen to music, movies, radio, news. We can read books. We can do all kinds of things. There's some censorship, probably more self-censorship. You're right around the corner from a beautiful library. I live in a small, small town with a beautiful library. Um, you know, what if we lost all that? And, and, you know, a lot of it could be just, well, I don't, we don't want to pay taxes for libraries. I mean, it could be as stupid as that. I mean, they're doing it in states in, in the United States, Kansas, Missouri. They're not raising enough taxes to fund <coughs> their schools. <laughs> I mean, uh, do and, and so, so do you, do you feel a, that that's science, my protest, yeah? science fiction gives you more freedom to explore right. these yeah. than, than if you were to write a... a, a, a a, a, a novel that's set in present day. Yeah, I, I guess I'm just. Um, well, I like science fiction. I like what I can do with it, and I I am going to write a book about the Academy. And, and Marianne won't let me tell you that. You're going to keep hearing Marianne, Marianne, Marianne. But she's my PR director and, <laughs> and a wonderful, wonderful person. So, but um, 33 years married. So uh, the. Um, uh, the one about the academy is going to be contemporary, and it's going to look at some educational issues and, of course, personal relationships. There's uh, three, uh, I th uh, three 
English professors, men, uh, who for various reasons are all single, divorced, widowed, and, and they're kind of trying to reestablish their lives and sort of a younger one, a middle career and late career. And uh, it may end up that I end up just focusing on one and the other two are tertiary. But I am going to play around with, you know, contemporary relationships and, you know, reestablishing things. an experience I don't have, you know, uh, Marianne didn't come with other children, but, you know, all blended families. So I, I, I'm going to do something a little more serious, I guess. But that one, I don't know. The sci-fi really works for me. I just love it. And, uh, yeah. I am researching a sci-fi book set in London. It's a little bit nearer future. It's going to be probably 2040. Uh, and <clears throat> it's also going to be political, but it, I'll just drop this little... It, Jack the Ripper makes an appearance. So there's there's just going to be, it's going to be a little different. It, it, it's not going to be high camp. It's going to be very serious, but uh, it, it'll be fun. So it's kind of a Doctor Who James Bond, I think. So, so you're in a very um, prolific um, phase of your life. And would you say, so the, the, the theme of this podcast really is around creativity in action, mm -hmm. of how creative people get their ideas out of their head into the world. And it's like you were... Um, kind of for 19 years you had these ideas you wanted to get them down and you tried to do that in between your your day job which you loved but um, it's almost like the floodgates have now opened oh the floodgates have opened you're, yeah. you're your yeah. own man now yeah um, and as I said I love the teaching but and I always wanted to be a university professor which you know took getting a PhD and doing a lot so I'm very proud of my career um, but yeah, the floodgates, yes, I should say not, yeah. The floodgates have opened, and uh, uh, I write every day. I write something every day. Um, I have another uh, sci-fi series, Beyond the Marsco series, that's, uh, again, more with war and power, and uh, but also a democracy, re restoring a democracy as opposed to an emperor. And, uh, right. so, so you've got uh, this, these four books, You've got this other series that's, um, that you're thinking about, about democracy. You've got the Jack the Ripper sci-fi something. Right, book, right. And, and the Academy, Academy the, the yeah, more yeah. contemporary one. That kind that of covers That is amazing. It. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, I, I, I start novels and, and write notes, and it, it's a little bit like throwing mud on the wall. If it sticks, if the characters, um, uh, yeah, that character works and... and that person could fall in love with that person, and, and I do want to see what that relationship was like in a conflicted society or something. So, yeah, you just kind of spin them out. Um, what, what is an artist, uh, the original term for cartoon was the artist kind of doing sketches saying, yeah, yeah, oh, this could be John the Baptist's head, so you know, maybe I will do a statue. So you do a lot of uh, playing around. But, yeah, I <clears throat> I would say right now I'm... I'm creating much more than, than I could have if, if, I, if I was writing. So, so just in a very I mean, brief, brief um, sort of overview, what is your writing process? You say you write every day. Do you have, you know, n nine to five? How does that oh, I, I, don't, I would love to go nine to five. I, I, I need to get into a better schedule, but um, I usually write something in the morning. I'm, I'm not a real morning person, and Marianne is, and I... And I promised that I would try to, you know, get onto her schedule. So she gets up pretty early, six o'clock or so, and and I have to have coffee. And then I I try to write and I try to stay off social media and I try to not answer email and and just uh, uh, you know so that I am writing whether I'm editing, uh, whether I'm writing something fresh. Um, these last two weeks I I've uh, actually come up with um, large paragraph on each chapter of this novel I'm working on and it's um, 25 chapters so I've got all the major characters and I've been doing some background on the characters and been going to places in London and I thought okay this could yeah this could work so because I, I, I'm really visual I really which is kind of odd putting something on Mars or in the asteroid belt but I, uh, <clears throat> I, I you know I've been to a couple places several places in London I say okay this will work yeah this this will be where this happens um, so, uh, yeah, usually by lunchtime, I, I, most of my creative juices are spent and I'll edit. Uh, editing is very difficult, especially from a rough draft. I, I when I was teaching writing, when I was teaching, you know, academic writing, teaching university students how to write, which is Sisyphus, but, um, 
I always would say, in my writing experience, a first draft is easy, especially now with Word. You, you know, as long as you saved a document, you know, call it whatever you want, you, you can write forever. And you just, you know, and I'm Italian, and I can just go and you know whatever, and and it even corrects some of your spelling. And but to go from that, and I've been reading through, you know, bits of it. I, I don't just go straight through, but so. When, I, when I'm done with that draft, say, of a chapter, I may have read it four times, but to actually then print it out and sit down with a pen and to work on that and then sit back down at the computer and, and put all those corrections in and then see it come off the printer and say, okay, now I've got something, that piece to me is the hardest piece. That is more difficult than the original rough draft. Because the rough draft, you can do anything. This third Marsco novel that I'm editing, I'm about a third of the way through right now. And um, but I was telling people at the beginning of summer, okay, I have to roll up my sleeves. I have to get. To, I have to work on this. And uh, I said, I, I know it's a mess because one of my main characters in the first chapter, she's introduced. The first time she's 18, the next time she's 20, and the next time she's 22, and it's all in the same afternoon. But as I was writing her the first time, I couldn't make up my mind how old to make her. And then I kept thinking, well, I want her to fall seriously in love. And an 18-year-old falling seriously, you know, come on, this is not Little House on the Prairie. And, and so I oh, she got a little bit older. And I thought, no, she's even got to be older than that. So, you know, and, and, and so the, the character was conceptually changing and then and characters boy they have a mind of their own you know zot who's one of the main characters in the first three books in my mind when i first thought of him was 12 and he's he's you know, just looked at me and said there's no way i'm a grown man you know you gotta you gotta do something quick here because i'm not going to be a 12 year old boy so <laughs> that was the end of that so 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 then after you've written the first draft and you've done the editing and you've got it to a state where you're quite happy with it um, you decided to self-publish rather right. than go to a, a traditional publisher. What was the reason? What were your reasons for that? Well, I probably sent query letters to eighty, hundred agents, and it, it's just a tough business to crack into. Um, so, I, I. I you know, I had been doing a few readings and, and whatnot, and people, you know, kind of wanted the book. And the chair of our department, <clears throat> who's now back to a traditional agent and a traditional publishing house, but uh, he writes, uh, uh, Anthony Neal Smith, if some of your listeners are into very graphic murder mysteries, he, he really uh, kind of horror story and murder mystery is kind of... And then he's, he's done a lot of Minnesota things about... Uh, Somalis in Minnesota uh, going to, to fight in civil wars over in the Horn of Africa. We just had an incident just this weekend in Minnesota where one apparently went on a rampage and stabbed several people. So it's a very, very contemporary issue and very um, timely issue. So he writes some serious stuff, but he he's very graphic. Neil is, is, I figured out one time, young enough to be my son. <laughs> anyway, he said to me, why should you self-publish? I, I got tired of the publishing you know, agents and whatever, and I just stuff was going out of print, and I just re-self-published it. And, and he has seven, eight, ten books. So I thought, okay. So I did one year of just um, putting it on Kindle, and then I thought, oh, the heck, I'm going to just do the whole thing. So I reformatted it and edited it again and, and so can we just pause sure. here because i think you know for a lot again a lot of writers and any any creative person when they you know you sent you sent out those 80 100 um things right. and, and got rejected that must have been very difficult oh yeah um i i uh, put this thing up every day now <laughs> brought to you by the marsco saga on my Facebook and on the Marsco Saga Facebook page on kindness, writing, and teaching. And half of them are about not giving up, and they're all really aimed at me. <laughs> yeah, in 18 years, I thought, you know, I, I could put my feet up. I, I could buy season tickets and drive out to Indiana and watch Notre Dame every weekend that they play in South Bend. I'm a big Notre Dame football fan. Uh, college American college football and uh, I got a place to stay my in-laws live there and you know I could give up I could have given up but I am stubborn <laughs> as Marianne will tell you as my father was before me 
Sicilian immigrants, you know, we're just tough, tough, stubborn people. So yeah, and the the, the self publishing though uh, is getting more and more legit. Uh, Barnes and Noble, which is still a big bricks and mortars bookstore chain in the United States, has said under certain conditions they're going to start putting self published books on their shelves. Now I haven't met those conditions, and they're you know you have to sell a thousand copies through your self-publishing and that's a huge uh, amount and uh, but they have other other stipulations but uh, you can put on a um, Kindle uh, or any e-device that is Kindle ready uh, and you can buy it in the uh, UK Amazon UK um, you can buy it anywhere in the world you can get Amazon and it's formatted for paper. You can get a paper copy, and it's formatted for electronic copy. So how how? But I'm still looking for an agent. I okay. mean, I will. Okay, we'll come to that. How, okay. how difficult was it to um, kind of get your head around all the technical stuff? Because again, some writers might feel, oh, okay, I'm I'm down in the dumps because I've been yeah. rejected. But actually, you know what? You know, I'm being, in, I'm, I really want to get this out, um, yeah. and I'm going to look into self-publishing. Yeah. But the, the sort of technology side and, and getting it all packaged up. Well, you can do it yourself, and you can do it cheap. And Amazon does have their, uh, what's it called, Create Space, And there are other venues that you can go to. Uh, they're probably the most expensive, and they're tied right to Amazon. And I just rolled up my sleeves and said, the heck with it. And again, Marianne and I talked about it. It's several thousand dollars um, per book to self-publish. And, uh, you know, I've just made that commitment. I'm going to do it. I've made the commitment to get all four of the Marsco books uh, self-published. And then we'll, we'll have to reevaluate after that. But, um, yeah, it, it, it was, a, again, a question of because I live in such a small area, uh, and I can go out to libraries, and I can go out to high schools. The very fact that I can show up with a book, uh, and I do readings, and I can sign a few books, sell a few books, it, it, to me it's been worth it. Some self-publishing, you have to buy 3,000, 5,000 copies. And I, you know, no copy of Marsco exists until somebody orders it except for the 40 copies that I've got at my home because I'm going to be doing some readings when I get back from London. But um, there's no warehouse full of them. And th so that, I mean, that to me was the big advantage. If I had gone to a small press and they'd done a run of two or 3,000, if I didn't sell those in six months, they're remaindered and, you know, that's it. And a as long as I'm alive, as long as my literary executors are willing to keep it in print, you know, it's in cyberspace and anybody can buy it. So uh, to me, that's uh, kind of fun, you know, knowing it, that it's that way. And I, I, I've been on these tours of London, these walking tours, handing out business cards, you know. <laughs> and so somebody from Turkey <laughs> says, oh, yeah, I can put it on my Kindle. It's like, I might have a sale in Turkey. You know? So um, you, uh, you started off doing it as an e-book. But right then now, it's, then uh, I went to print, yeah. yeah because, print ori, yeah. Because having the, the print book gave you an advantage. Right. Just, I can give it to libraries, and, uh, and I have, and, and libraries buy it. Um, there's a couple of websites of friends of mine that are librarians who tip me off to these uh, websites that librarians use, and I can go look and I found out that there's a library somewhere in Illinois that bought copies of my books. I, I don't know what the connection is. I don't know if it's a former student, it's a librarian there. I don't know, but they bought my books. So libraries have been buying it. I, I've gotten some very good reviews, and that puts it into national spotlight for a while. And again, libraries buy it, and um, hopefully, bookstores that, that like speculative sci-fi will not uh, balk at stocking it, and, and that would be a, a big issue. A conventionally printed book, uh, the, the, the bookstore can send the books back to the publisher. Uh, with my book, they can't. And so that makes it a, a risky proposition for them. They either have to sell it at the stated price or drastically reduce the price and sell it at a loss. And, and that makes, especially a small bookstore reluctant to so how so. um how difficult has it been to get your book your physical book in, in into bookstores um a f well a few carry it um 
we have this little thing called Read Local in southwest Minnesota where uh, the, about 20 of the local writers, and they're writing things from Native American history to poetry to war. Uh, um, you know, they're Vietnam vets, and they write about their experience in the war. I'm about the only science fiction writer. I think I am the only one, although I think there's a kid's, a real children's science fiction book, like with a dog with a space helmet on the cover, but I'm the only kind of adult science fiction. Um, and we're in a couple of art shops and a coffee shop in town so people can buy it there it's and, on consignment and, and do you personally go to the bookshop and say can i speak to the manager Would you I, like i've that? gone to several that's actually i kind of stopped doing that because it, that one you know you're talking to somebody face to face and they just kind of still think oh self-published you know vanity press and i just got tired of that kind of energy so it's really much better to try to get reviews go to libraries and talk to people. As we were, as I was explaining earlier, I've been um, setting up this, um, it's about a 75-minute presentation about how to get started as fiction writing, as a fiction writer, not just science fiction. And I, uh, I did one library already. I've got two libraries lined up. I'm trying to get some. This is before Christmas. In the spring, I, I'm going to try to get some libraries lined up to do that. And so I talk and one time I went and sold a couple books. Another time I didn't sell any books. But at least they know who I am. They take my business card. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's self-publishing is self-promoting. Now, if I lived in London, I would have many more millions of potential readers. And maybe I could get into some bookstores. But um, um, uh, I live in Marshall, Minnesota. This, this, this aspect, I think, is also, again, challenging for us, us writers because... Um, many of us uh, you know, feel sort of we're quite introverted. We want to get on with the writing. We want to hand over to the publisher or whatever, go away and publish yeah. it and, and, and publicize it for me. Um, but as a self-published author, you have to say, as you say, self-promotion. Um, um, how difficult is it to, to, to get a gig at a library? How difficult is it to get a review? What, what is it that you do to overcome some of these challenges? Mm -hmm. Um, well, frankly, the reviews I paid for. There are several companies that, for a small fee, will will do a review, and um, you know you have a right of refusal if you don't like the way they reviewed the book. Fortunately, they've all been very, very positive. Uh, I always encourage people that have read the book to put a review on Amazon, whether you're a self-published or a traditionally published author. Reviews on Amazon matter because. Once you get 50 reviews, Amazon treats that book differently than any other book uh, that, that doesn't have 50 reviews. So those are very, very important. And they'll catch. I tell people, if your last name is Zarzana, please don't write a review because they have caught, caught out people, you know, reviewing their own book. And, you know. But um, reviews are very, you know, those kind of spontaneous reviews are very, very important. Uh, the libraries... At least in the United States, librarians are looking for other uses of the library, except for people coming in and reading the paper. And I know in our library, there's always a jigsaw puzzle being so built. So you would you would drop them an email saying, I'm "Yeah, an author, right. I can come and talk." Come to and you. talk. I can do one of two. I can either do, uh, you know, talk about my writing or talk about writing in general. Um, in Minnesota, there is just like here. You know, you have lottery money that helps the arts. Uh, we have a um, small increase in our sales tax, which like the VAT, I guess, would be the closest equivalent, uh, dedicated to the arts and the environment. And if you want to talk politics, it was the hunters in Minnesota and the artsy people that got together. <laughs> half the money goes to the environment, which means there's ducks and geese and go shoot them, and half goes to libraries. And so legacy money, and they can pay me through a legacy grant and so I just remind the libraries, and and uh, it, you know, and then they let me sell a few books, and and I always, you know, meet people that say, oh, I don't like sci-fi, but I think I'll read this book. In fact, I've had a couple people tell me I read it, and I don't like sci-fi, and it was really very, because uh, it's so political, you know. Mm -hmm. I think it's thinly veiled politics, but. And, and you're quite good, as you were saying, about um, handing out business cards and, and yep. telling people that, yeah. you, that you meet right. uh, every day about what right. you do. Not on the tube, I was <laughs> tempted, but I thought, no, I, you know, being a, an American, I might get thrown out for that. But, um, yeah, I, uh, yeah, a, a, anytime I, I see people, I mean, I have actually stopped a couple of people that I've seen in a public space that are reading science fiction books. 
And so this is in America, not here. I'm a little more a, a little more quiet and over and, here. And, and what, what response do you get when? Well, usually they're young kids, you know. And so uh, I just say, "Oh, you like sci-fi, huh?" You know, I, it's 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 strange. I think it's a big city. I don't think it's England, I, I, being English, but um, uh, big cities people, you know, are kind of shut down. You don't look at people and smile and. And of course, I live in a town of thirteen thousand people, and and we're not a suburb. I mean, it's thirteen thousand people, and then acres of corn, and soybeans, and and uh, poultry farms, and then you get to cities, you know, and two or three hour car drive, and so you know everybody. At least you know everybody by face. And so uh, I'm used to seeing people and say hi and say hi to their dog, and and you just don't do that in London. And people are just very so. It's a little it's a little different over here. Um, the, I was at this big residence. Now I'm at a smaller residence for a couple nights. Um, uh, Goodnow College, which is for graduate students, and uh, I'm an alum, so I got to stay there. But the only person that has talked to me, kind of bubbly, friendly, is another American. <laughs> it's just kind of funny, but that's fine. Yeah. So I guess just to sum up now, no, okay. um, it, it really um, thinking about your journey as as an author um, to, to publication and to spreading the word. Um, uh, trying to find some nuggets um, for our listeners who um, may be struggling with their own creative project or whether it's a novel or something that they want to do. Um, what, what I'm hearing you say is that it's about um, stubbornness and tenacity, um, first of all, to try and get the, to, to, to write the book, uh, and then the same stubbornness and tenacity in getting it um, published, self-published, even in the face of all these rejections. You said, you know, no, I'm going to do this myself, I'm going to get it out there. Um, and also, you keep ma- mentioning Marianne, of course, whom, whom I know, who's delightful and talented in her own way. And that, that alliance... Um, is, has been very important for you in, in your success right. in all your life. Yeah. I, I mean, that's how <clears throat> we met. Um, I was a graduate student, and she had graduated from Notre Dame and was back uh, actually as a an editor for one of the Notre Dame publications. And uh, so uh, language, literature, um, you know, has always been a, <clears throat> a basis for our, our uh, relationship. But she uh, professionally worked in PR uh, for many years, and uh, then then decided to um, uh, pursue the poetry, and she got a, a, an MFA uh, in in creative writing with an emphasis in poetry. And uh, she teaches at where I used to teach, Southwest Minnesota State University, and is the director of creative writing. But yeah, we have a really balanced um, uh, relationship, and and. We're very, very fortunate, you know. I that Virginia Woolf, you know, room of your own with a lock in the door and 500 pounds a year, which is not a lot more money than than it sounds today. But in a way, I have that. But I had to retire to have that, you know. Marianne didn't come with that kind of money. I couldn't have married it. So, uh, but and it took me a while, you know. I don't want to tell your listeners how old I am, but it, it took me a while to uh, to reach a, an age and station with that. But uh, back to the writing and, and everything, all successful writers have to engage in PR, all successful artists. Um, you know, I have a sister-in-law, Marianne's sister, who's a, a visual artist, and, uh, you know, you got to get into galleries. You have to get your, your, your work has to be on a wall. Somebody has to see it. Uh, you got to be somewhere where somebody's going to review the art exhibit, and and it's just it's just pounding the pavement. And uh, I have a disadvantage of living in a small corner of Marshall, Minnesota. Fortunately, the university has such a good reputation of writers that uh, you know all I have to do is mention, well, I'm associated with Southwest State, and at least in Minnesota, that oh well, you know, you must know so and so and so and so, and and um, so that helps a little bit. Uh, but yeah, it is self. Publishing is self-promoting, but regular publishing is promoting. I mean, you just you have to get out there. The the days, uh, you know, I, I guess J.K. Rowling doesn't need to self-promote, but uh, you know, she had a, a long curve to get published, and you know, hers was boom, you know. But most writers aren't going to have that. It's not going to take off like that, you know. So, what is your advice? to um, upcoming writers or writers who are in a funk or any creative who is facing a challenge right. at the moment? Uh, uh, You've got to have a positive attitude. Keep working with your writing. 
uh, you got to be writing something good or you wouldn't be writing. So um, just keep at it. If you have to have two or three projects running at once because one's kind of gone cold, I mean, there are no rules. I, I mean, <laughs> you know, I was supposed to be a toady English professor. And I kept telling my writing students, in the end, there's no rules. You know, you make up the rules and, and uh, you know, violate any grammar rule you want as long as it works, as long as it's clear. And um, for, there are no rules to getting a successful career. You, you have to believe in yourself. And one of my slides that I, when I do these presentations about being a writer, I said, you know, nobody likes a bragger. Nobody likes people in your face talking about how good you are. I don't know why there's a certain political candidate that that seems to be his only platform, but, you know, nobody really likes that. So you have to be humble. So you don't ever want that part of your personality outside of your mind. But, you know, you don't practice to to be an athlete and then go to the coach and say, Coach, I'm ready to sit on the bench, you know. You don't chant, we're number two, we're number two. You, you got to be your own cheerleader and say, you know, I can do this and, and keep it up. Most people quit, you know, and uh, um, that's, not how, that's not how you do it. It's hard to beat a person who doesn't quit. So, so don't quit. Don't believe quit. In yourself. And I love this. There are no rules. There are so no rules. I know. You whatever. heard that from a guy wearing a tie. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can get out there, do whatever we want. And, you know, that's up to you. You wanted to wear a tie. There yeah, are no rules. That's, there are no cool. rules, but I mean, I think there are some conventional rules that we should live by. I don't want to. I could drive in this country, and I have driven in this country, but I don't want to use American rules when I drive in this country. But yeah, but uh, younger students. I work a, still, and I really, really like working with younger, younger writers. Even the way they ask a question, they're, they're already stopping themselves. I know I'm not a very strong writer, but... And I go, no, don't say that. You know, just ask the question. Yeah. yeah. Just yes. don't, don't, don't put yourself down don't before put anybody yourself, else. No negative yeah. self-talk. Yes. Yeah. Because if, if so, you don't believe in yourself, who's oh, going to believe in you? Who's going to believe in you? Yeah. So this is a brilliant way to, to finish off. But before we go to the next section, okay. uh, which is the treasure hunt... Okay, and I got one. Um, uh, before we do that, uh, if people want to find out more about you, uh, James Lozana, and your okay. books, what should they do? Um, well, they can always go to Amazon and look for my books. Uh, and if you go to Amazon and type in Zarzana, Z-A-R-Z-A-N-A, -A, there might be my cousin uh, who writes in Italian. Uh, is it Francesco? What, uh, anyway, it's an F name. He's a, I can't remember his you name. You are James. I'm James, James A. James. James A. Zarzana. Uh, the other thing is I do have the Marsco Saga uh, www.themarscosaga, Mars Co., just like Mars Company, uh, no extra spaces or anything, at .com. And that's a, a web page. It might be down because we're tweaking it a little bit, but I do have a web page devoted to the Mars Co. Saga, the books. I do have a web page, jamesacearzana.com, more um, ways to get the books and stuff about me, and I do a blog there periodically. And I do have a Facebook page, uh, the Marsco Saga Facebook page, so you can find me on all that. And some of those have, my, have an uh, email address that I'll answer periodically. But, but mainly, uh, yeah, get the books. Uh, they're long. They're nose bleeders, uh, meaning you fall asleep, you read and break your nose, bleed your nose. But uh, sci-fi people like that kind of stuff. And there are uh, a big glossary at the end because I do, you know, it's got it. It's sci-fi, and these are geeks and nerds running a computer, so I invent a lot of terminology, but I stick it in the end. So. And I will be putting up all those links on the show oh, notes. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you. So um, uh, you, can, you can come to, to the tigerspirit.co.uk uh, uh, podcast page, and uh, you'll find uh, the links there as well. So here we are at the end of our interview, but we are going to talk about the treasure hunt. Now, the treasure hunt is a segment in the Tiger Spirit podcast where um, my guests and I um, offer you a treasure, something we love that we're fascinated with, uh, for you to go and hunt, hence treasure hunt. So, James Lazana, what's okay. your treasure? I was going to do an American destination, but I got sass, said no, can't do that. Um, Bletchley Park, I, one of the things that I wanted to do while I was here uh, was get up to Bletchley Park and uh, fascinating, fascinating. Uh, apparently, uh, it's not part of the Imperial War Museum, 
because uh, I asked them uh, at the one here, uh, not very far from here actually, uh, about how to get there, and they were very helpful in telling me, oh, take a train here, take a train there. But um, it, you get off the train in Bletchley, it's a 100-meter walk, uh, I don't know, 7, whatever it was, 12 pounds, 10 pounds, to get in, and very, very fascinating, uh, kind of the murky, dark, beginnings of, of really the internet world and spying because of cipher and cyberspace. And I mean, it just ties right into Marsco. Uh, but uh, so anyway, that that would be... And this is, Bletchley Park was where Enigma was Right, set. the the, the, uh, the breaking of the code. Uh, yeah, there's a, a, a book and a movie called Enigma, movies from the 90s. Young Kate Winslet uh, is in it. Uh, the Robert Harris book, isn't it? Right, right. Um, and also the Imitation Games? The Imitation yeah. Games. About Alan Turing. Yeah, code specifically yeah. about him and his machine called a bomb, B-O-M-B-E, uh, was in a way the forerunner of the modern computer. And then right around from that museum is the uh, smaller museum... Uh, but it's about one of the first real, a real computer uh, used to breaking yet another uh, set of German codes. Um, but there, it's just very fascinating. Brilliant. So yeah. that's Bletchley Park. That's Bletchley your, Park. Your James Lozano's treasure for treasure. you guys to hunt. Right, if you, right. If that takes your fancy. Um, well, for me, uh, my treasure I would like to offer you, given that this whole uh, episode has been about writing, is Stephen King's book on writing. Um, and there are lots and lots of different books out there um, giving advice about writing. But what I love about Stephen King's book is, is also his style of his novels. are um, They're easy to read. And one of his things is, that I remember from the book is about tr- your writing should be transparent. Um, don't show off with your flourishing uh, long sentences and your fancy words. Just... The, you should not actually be so conscious of the writing. You should be just reading this book and getting stuck into stuck into story and the characters and the themes and all that aspect of it. Um, and that's why I, I love Stephen Stephen King's novels um, because I think he also, it, in terms of his novels, he uses the horror and, for example, like Carrie, um, it's about a teenage girl who's bullied at school um, and she gets her revenge with her telekinetic powers. At one level, it's a horror story, but actually it's also about um, the, the, the outsider, the one who is bullied, um, who finds her way of getting her, her vengeance back. Um, and I think I really liked his, his book about the craft of writing um, because uh, in itself it's easy to read and he says uh, quite a lot of interesting things that are um, practical tips uh, as well as talking about his, his life as a writer. So that's my treasure for you to hunt down. Um, James Azana, thank you very much for being oh, thank on the you. Tiger Spirit podcast. Creative Conversations is a Tiger Spirit podcast conceived and presented by me, Yang Mei Ui. For this and other episodes in the series, as well as articles and tips on turning creativity into action, check out our blog at tigerspirits.co.uk. Thank you for listening and see you next time.